We've all been there. You walk into the big box store expecting to find a nice board and walk out the door and do some project at home and you find out it takes you hours to sort through truckloads of lumber to find one decent board in one of those ginormous, got everything you could possibly want and nothing that's really any good box stores. Now, I'm not just going to throw those guys under the bus, I mean uniformly, because sometimes you've just got to have something right now and nobody else in town has it. But most of the time, if you're looking for nice lumber, a big box store is not the place to find it. I want to tell you some of the things you can look for to avoid having to go home with a crappy piece of lumber. Because sometimes a crappy piece of lumber is way worse than no lumber at all. So if you've been watching this channel any period of time at all, you know that I'm a big, big proponent for a full service lumber yard usually a mom and pop lumber yard. In my case, here in Roseburg, it's Garrison's Building Supply. They've been in business for over 100 years. Now they've recently changed ownership, but they're hewing to the line. They're still selling the good material and they still have people, the same people, and they know what they're talking about. Those are two big advantages over corporate box stores who are stuck with bottom feeding. So let's get into the weeds a little bit on the, the species in the Pacific Northwest and the characteristics and the defects and the things you're looking for when you need to buy a good board. I've already bragged about the fact that Douglas fir lumber is everywhere on the West Coast. That's what you're looking for and at here mostly is kiln dried Douglas fir lumber. Now I have used plenty of green Douglas fir, you know, where the moisture content is, you know, 17, 18, 19 percent. That's around the cutoff for, you know, selling framing material. Kiln dried is lower than that. I'm going to make this up and say 10, 11 percent, maybe single digits. In my judgment now, when I am selling a product and wanting people not to call back because they're unhappy, for me it's worth spending the extra money for kiln dried. It's less likely to experience the movement of twisting, bowing or cupping or crowning for characteristics, things that can happen to a board as the water leaves, as it dries out. Let me show you what some of those look like and the first thing you look for to minimize that. Here's the proof that this company buys nice material. If you look at the end of a unit of lumber in one of the box stores, all you're going to see is the heart or the pith. You see that? That's the very center of the tree and in this whole stack I only see those one, two, three pieces. At a box store, you're going to see three or four that don't have the heart. That's because it's a defect. Oh, there's number four. The thing that happens, with a heart center is, as that board dries, the forces, the radial forces that are unleashed when a round tree with um, concentric growth rings is opened up into a board shape they're going to dry differently on both sides of the heart and the board will always twist. So if you need to buy a board that is not going to twist, maybe a mantle or maybe a, a door jam or maybe a shelf that you're going to put your part of your library on. You don't want it to twist. Make sure it doesn't have that boxed heart, bullseye heart. That pith is where you're going to get a big crack and a big twist. So here are one, two, three examples of Wayne. Wayne is the outer circumference of the log. That's where the bark was. That's where the forest started. And it reduces the cross section of the board. So it reduces the strength of the board and it makes it harder to work with. Now at some point, particularly in studs and a lot of framing members, you can lose that much size and you don't lose enough strength to worry about. But here's an example of a board where the wane is continuous around the whole flat side of the board. I would pass on that unless I was going to cut it up for fire blocks or, you know, maybe, maybe a trimmer or something. That's a defect that you can watch for. And in a store like this, it is the exception. And in a store like the big box stores, it's the rule. Darn near every board has Wayne on it. So I'm so proud of my friends here right now. And you're going to hear me say this more often, but I've got to look around here to find a board with the defects that I'm trying to illustrate. Here's a utility one by six, okay? Now sometimes we all need a utility board. Utility is the bottom grade. Utility means junk, but sometimes junk will do it. But this is an example of an excessively large knot, okay? There is no structural value at all to that board right there. Can you see that that cross grain of that knot means that board's not working at all? You've got, you know, an inch and an inch and a quarter, you've got two and a quarter inches of strength right there. And if I drop this board 
or leaned on it, it would break. Now, is that intuitive? Probably. You probably already knew that. But it's worth keeping an eye out for really big knots, and usually those happen in a lower lumber grade than number two or standard and better, which is sort of the baseline framing material that you ought to be looking for, that you can find better and you can find worse. There are, you know, budget lumber companies that'll have a lot of number three, and number three has got a lot of this. And sometimes it's all you need because, you know, you don't have to have, you know, lean hamburger in every, at every barbecue, right? Sometimes entry level is good enough, but you're going to be disappointed if you don't go somewhere where the product is good if it's a good product you need. Here's a good example of some weighing that might cause you to reject that board. But on the other hand, the board is pretty darn straight. The grain is pretty tight. It's not a bad board, it's just reduced right here. But there's plenty of places you can use it. So don't be a knothead. I mean, you can pick through a whole stack and throw away everything that doesn't suit you perfectly and you're being a jerk. If you're realistic about where it is that you can use a board that's a little less quality, well then by all means use that. Because if you want to buy number one, well then lay down your money and buy a unit, buy some number one boards. But on the other hand, if you go someplace that's got a good general quality of lumber, don't make those people, you know, only get a sale out of 10% of the material because you have an unreasonable expectation. But if you've got an unreasonable expectation, you've already burned out on the box stores and you've already found a place that sells some good lumber. So balance that the way you want, but you can't go to Walmart and get the top quality material that you might get at, I don't know, fill in the blank, some other store that carries a little more expensive line. So don't expect to get select grade lumber out of a number three grade stack. So I have two, what are these, 16 foot two by sixes here, and they're pretty good boards, but they are examples of two different defects. This is an example of a crown. A crown is a deviation from straight across the width of the board, okay? This has got probably maybe three quarters of an inch of crown. The middle up there, can you see that? That's a hard thing to deal with in a wall or in a set of floor joists, but it's easy to deal with with sheetrock backing. Now this other board, let me put this down, has been damaged in handling. Now this might have happened when the tree was fell, this might have happened on a logging landing, this might have happened on a log truck, or it might have been a careless forklift operator has just torn off part of that board. And that's the reason that this was in this had already been rejected once. But, back to the recurring theme, there's plenty of uses this board could be put to. You could cut around these knots and, uh, you know, still pretty much get your money's worth if you come across this buried in the middle of a stack. So twist around here today is a little hard to find, but it is a rotation. It's a propeller action, right? And like I mentioned, it usually happens around the heart. On this board, the heart was just off the side of the board, and so the crack and the twist is subtle. And you have to look twice, but sometimes there's just too much to straighten out once you get home. Grain characteristic. And what I mean by that is how fast or how slow was the tree growing? There's a good example right here. Now, none of this is classic old growth configuration. I mean, that's what, maybe five or six growth rings per inch. And this is four. And this is three. And we're back to four. And here's two, two growth rings per inch. Each year, this tree was growing that much on each side. Now, that's wonderful in terms of putting on fiber, but it's not wonderful in terms of strength and durability and just the ability of the board to do its job. When it's growing that fast, it is just, I mean, it's a hothouse plant, essentially. It's not something that's strong and uh, will take deflection and impact like, you know, a four, five, six, seven, eight growth ring per inch board is better. So check the end of the board, not just for the heart center, but for how fast the tree was growing. Another defect that can show up in Douglas fir and pine species is pitch. Pitch seams, see this? We got a pitch seam that starts back here and it gets worse and it gets worse and now you've got kind of a, almost a bark inclusion and then it gets back to good solid wood. So right in here, this board is compromised. So if one shows up like this and you're putting joists across, you know, you know, a mezzanine or something, put that up so that that's in 
compression instead of tension. Make that the bottom of the board, make this the top of the board, stick and move, it's not gonna hurt a thing. Now in two by fours, it's not a big deal because the dimensions are almost always perfect. But in wider boards, just the process of sawing and making the boards themselves can introduce some differences in width. I mean, sometimes you'll buy a stack of two by tens that are nine and a quarter. Sometimes you'll buy a stack that are nine and a half. Sometimes it'll be one dimension on one end and one dimension on the other. And that is, I mean, that's just the way it works. You gotta be aware of that. But look at this bad boy. I mean, what is that, eight and a half? No, it's not eight and a half inches. There's just a split. And that split is nobody's fault. I mean, that's just, you know, trees are part of the biomass. So I'm going to wrap this up by talking about wood species. And in the Pacific Northwest, in a lumber yard where you're thinking about building a building or a shed or a, you know something outside, a deck, the species that you're going to run into are Douglas fir, and we've showed you miles of that, red cedar, Port Orford cedar, cedars generally, we'll show you some of those, and then white wood, which can include spruce, pine, hemlock, white fir, grand fir, you know, White woods are lumped together in a lot of applications for construction. I'm standing next to some spruce that's often used for fascia board. It's soft, it's light, it stays straight, it's not as prone to cupping and twisting and you can get it up off the ground and it takes paint well, but it's not very strong. So spruce and cedars are often used for trim. Cypress is a type of a cedar and these kinds of things are used you know, at the corners and at the overhangs and places that need to be trimmed out on the outside of a building. Also on decks, because cedars and redwoods are rot resistant. Now they don't have a large inventory of red cedar in here today, but here's some beautiful two by four red cedar. Very, very sort of characteristic smell. Rot resistant, beautiful, nice rosy color. And here is a very similar species, Port Orford cedar, only occurs on the west coast of the United States and I think in Japan, or it used to, but it's, it's white. It's a white color. It is not as rot resistant as red cedar. It is incredibly fragrant. It's a nice material. Cedars are my favorite, favorite species on the planet. So now we're in the main of Gerritsen's, which is where they have their moldings and their specialty boards, and it's dry and it's civilized. This is the place I had to come to find a hemlock board. I couldn't find one out there with all the Douglas fir and the cedar and the pressure-treated material that you can't tell anyway. But hemlock is a very tight-grained, kind of hard, fibrous board that's often used in moldings because it just doesn't like to split. If you ever tried to split hemlock firewood, you know it doesn't like to split. It sometimes has these black lines in it way tougher than pine, kind of a similar appearance. And you may go somewhere and they will have hem fur on the end of a unit, hem fur, white wood. That can encompass hemlock, pine, grand fur, white fur, you know, almost anything that is white in color is lumped into a white fur or hem fur designation. Not as good as Douglas fur, but you know, you can get work done with it. But let me just tell you this, white wood generally is very photoreactive. That is, if you leave a white wood board in the sun, it's gonna crawl. I don't know why, but I know it works like that. So here's another great example of why a full service lumber yard is the way to go. Garretsons can source from really specialty lumber houses up and down the coast. So Destero, Deshero, they have the coolest material. And here's an example of a grade designation you don't see all the time. Kiln dried, Douglas fir, rough, rough sawn. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what the FD stands for. This is an eight by eight, free of heart center. You see that? This is a beautiful, beautiful board that I'm not going to unwrap because it's expensive. It's sitting on two little stacks of knotty alder for Robbie Lieberman, a top notch builder around here. So when you find somebody that can order exactly what you want, get it there in a reasonable period of time, and you can have confidence that when you take the wrapper off, you're gonna be happy with it. Take your business there. And uh, because you do not want to look in your rear view mirror and say, darn, they closed up. They got run out by the corporate monopolies. 
when if I would have supported them just a little more consistently, maybe they'd still be standing there ready to fill those specialty needs for quality lumber that you just can't get anywhere else. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.